As early as 1850, travelers to central Brazil have reported termite mounds with pale glows of phosphorescent light. Of course this caught my attention because if you know anything about me, you know I love things that glow and twinkle. So for the last year, I saved up every penny I have for me and my crew to fly all the way out to western Brazil to trace the footsteps of these explorers and create a beautiful documentary with modern day low light technology of the planet's most incredible extraterrestrial glowing phenomena. This time, what I'm hunting for is world's brightest bioluminescent organism. Now, Brazil's summer rains are about to begin. The American dollar is super strong and somehow I got incredibly cheap flights. So I couldn't be more certain that I meant to do this. The timing is perfect and I'm ready to make you the most epic episode of Trailblazer yet. <laughs> What's up, I'm Josh Garcia, I'm in Sao Paulo, and you're probably wondering where the heck I'm taking you now. You're probably thinking the Amazon, because that's where all of us nature junkies go, right? I mean, when it comes to ecology, let's be honest, Amazon is the one-stop shop, America's default darling. But, I'm gonna shift gears and take you somewhere you've never been before, somewhere just as rich in biodiversity that also features nature's biggest, most awesome, beautiful bioluminescent natural phenomena, and I am so excited. But here's the issue. The thing that I'm hunting is dependent on the weather. So if that doesn't cooperate, I'm gonna leave here empty-handed, and that scares the crap out of me, especially considering how much money I've sunk into getting me and my team here. So, fingers crossed. Usually, I'm such a planner in these shoots, but this time, I couldn't be more unprepared. I'm literally at a disadvantage in every single way. I try to connect with the locals in the region that we're going to, but there's so little information online, plus no one answers their phone, and if they did, my Portuguese is a nightmare. I couldn't book a hotel. I have no idea where we're gonna stay tonight, how much it's gonna cost, how habitable it is, how close it is to what we're looking for. We've got no internet, no cell phones. Thanks, Brent. No team of scientists to depend on for answers. I got tired of trying to plan the unplannable and I just decided to go out on a limb, take a risk, and buy my ticket. I'm going with my heart on this one because I refuse to die without seeing these incredible creatures. And this is what I've been dreaming about. And nothing's gonna get in the way of that. This is my kind of adventure. Okay, we're here, and it's been a 13 hour drive, and I'm uh, not a very happy person right now. There's one hotel here, it's probably the only one for the next 100 miles according to the locals that we stopped and talked to, so yeah, we don't have a choice. We're staying here. Guess what I got? Not bad, only 20 bucks a night. Good night. We're here, Emmis National Park in the western state of Guayas, and home to the Brazilian Cerrado, which I've learned is not so easy to find. In a way, it's kind of hidden in plain sight, and far more threatened than the Amazon. It's known as a Cerrado, which means closed, because it was once as impenetrable as the deepest rainforest. But with all the dirt roads recently built here in the name of big agriculture, it's way more accessible, but it's still a pain in the butt to get to. The Cerrado is the largest, most biologically rich savanna region in all of South America, home to 5% of all life on the planet. That's 935 species of birds, 300 mammals, including endangered species like the Cerrado fox, the giant anteater, jaguars, the main wolf, Martian pampas deers, and tons of ticks. Plus there's 12,000 species of plants with half of those exclusively found here. That's more than the Amazon. 
It's about three times the size of Texas too. So there's no question it's a biodiversity hotspot. Just wait till you see what happens at night. You may have heard of the great African savanna, which has a similar climatic cycle of drought and rain too. And that makes sense because 180 million years ago, the land I'm standing on right now was connected to Africa as part of the giant supercontinent called Gondwana. Cool, huh? So this is what I came here for. What? Piles of dirt? Yes, but these are magical piles of dirt, and soon you're gonna see why. These are termite mounds, and millions of them occupy the Cerrado. As a matter of fact, we can find up to 130 mounds per acre. That's a lot of mounds. And deep in an underground chamber is the termite queen, laying tens of thousands of eggs per day, or an egg every three seconds. But that's nearly 11 million eggs per year. And when you take into account that a termite queen will often live till she's about 20 years old, it's almost a quarter of a billion babies over the course of her lifetime. That's creepy, gross, and totally awesome. Now, each of these little mountains takes decades to build, and that's because the termites that occupy them have had over 200 million years of experience to perfect them. Not only are they fireproof and waterproof, but they're so strong they can hold all 200 pounds of me, and that's because their walls are up to seven inches thick. Oh, God. Oh, crap. <laughs> We're stuck. <laughs> We're stuck. It's like comical. Our plan of attack is to put wood underneath the tires like that and hopefully we'll get a little bit of friction and be able to get out here. And we're miles away from anything. So the last thing I want to do is get stuck out here. Wish me luck. We succeed. Well, that's a good feeling. Seriously. We're so far out here, if we were stuck, we'd be devastated. But it's beautiful. A beautiful place to get your car stuck. But hopefully it doesn't happen again. Lesson learned tomorrow, we're bringing a shovel. These termites are constantly under attack because they sustain tons of creatures. Flicker birds carve massive holes inside these mounds to nest. Armadillos eat their termites too by digging holes near the base. And I'm not sure if they eat the termites or not, burrowing swole owls nest in the abandoned holes made by the armadillos and the prairie dogs. So though it may look like just a big worthless mound of dirt, it's actually the link between a symbiotic relationship for all occupants of the Cerrado. Everyone that lives here depends on these termite mounds, but the most awesome mound dweller comes out at night. Here we go, roll it down, roll it down, take the camera. It's soaked. Oh my god! Dude, that camera is soaked all the way through. Oh shit. We're in the middle of nowhere. If we lose one of our three cameras, we lose the entire shoot. I knew there was forceful rain showers this time of year, but I had no idea there was this much water. And we actually need this rain to see our critter tonight. But we don't need this much rain. Let's get out of here and hope we can save that camera, man. Let's go. The problems just keep coming. Look where we are, and look what just happened. No, this is bigger. This is what makes me and my team awesome. We've suffered a flat, we've gotten stuck twice, I lost one camera to the rain, we've been totally lost and disoriented, and soon we're gonna be completely alone in Jaguar territory, surrounded by ticks and mosquitoes very late at night miles away from anyone with no real guarantee that we're going to even find what we're looking for. I don't think many production companies are willing to take these kinds of risks, and that's what gives me and my team an edge. And as brutal as this rain has been, the more we get, the better my chances of finding my critters. So I really can't complain. Just wish me no more flat tires and lots of good luck. All right, I'm here. All my efforts come down to this very moment. If I've done everything right, and all my seasonal calculations are on point that when the sun goes down, one of the most unique natural phenomenons on planet Earth should occur. Camera's ready, guys? Yeah. All right, all we gotta do is wait.
coals and ashes. But what is it? Now you guys will never guess what we're looking at. Each of these termite mounds are occupied by hundreds and hundreds of glowing beetle larvae of the species Pyrrhinus termitiluminens. So it's not the termites that are glowing, it's an entirely different species. As adults, they're pretty unassuming, but during the mating season, they lay their eggs around the base of the termite mound, and when the eggs hatch, they hold the mound hostage by crawling up the sides and burrowing into the exterior, essentially hijacking these termite mounds. Each of these young beetle larvae are all glowing for a very good reason. The phenomenon we're looking at is simply an evolutionary response by Pyrrhinus termitillumens larva to a short pulse of a very rich food supply. Each of them is chronologically wired to illuminate during this time of year via chemical reaction in the back of their head in order to take advantage and feast on the annual termite migrations. So what the heck does this even mean? During the rains, the termite queen in each mound produces offspring different from the usual termite workers. These termites have wings, and at this time of year, the winged termites take flight in order to mate with unrelated termites in other mounds. This is basically nature's way of reducing the genetic stranglehold of the single breeding queen from each mound. Make sense? So this whole thing gets cooler. The flying termites are positively phototactic, which means they're attracted to light, and the beetle larvae know this. So they respond to this flying termite mating frenzy by glowing to distract the termites and lure them in. They glow only during this time of year to take advantage of all this flying food. Yep, these little guys are carnivorous little meat eaters. And because the termites are attracted to their glow, I found a way to collect them on my LED and sacrifice them to the glowing gods so we can see them feasting in action. Check this out. The larvae are super smart too. They're highly sensitive to vibrations of an approaching termite, and to increase their chances to feed, they glow even brighter, hypnotizing their termite, and eventually snatching them up with their monster mandibles. They use their pseudopods to brace themselves inside their hole, which allows them to contract backwards and drag their termite down to its death. Basically, they'll prey on anything that enters their strike range. So many a termite will meet the end of its life in the jaws of one of these inconsiderate house guests. Conniving little suckers. If any mating termites survive this larval trap, as well as other predators, they'll eventually return to the ground with their mate to create a new mound and a new colony. So, I'm trying to get some footage of our termite mounds, and guess who we met out here in the savannah that lives in this hole? A flicker bird! Listen. That she's threatened and she's trying to let us know she's here. So, like I mentioned, these mounds are homes to lots of creatures. They're always being repaired and kept up by the termites. But if a termite tries to fill the holes made by a flicker bird, then it gets eaten. So, if you thought your roommate in college was terrible, try being a flicker bird bunking with a termite. Believe me, it's much worse. You hear that? Okay, let's leave her alone. Let's get out of here. The Serrano is often overshadowed by the Amazon, making it easy to disregard the ecosystem here. And that's why 80% of the Serrano has been partially degraded through the conversion to agricultural lands. Today, Brazil is the world's second leading soy exporter. As a matter of fact, nearly two thirds of Brazil's soybeans are grown here, and that's what's responsible for bulldozing down our termite mounds. But don't boycott soy products, boycott animal agriculture. Because all this soy production is being driven largely by our planet's growing appetite for meat so that the US and China can continue to feed themselves bacon, hamburger, and steak. 80% of all the soy products grown here are now used for animal feed, and it's our insatiable desire for meat products that drives the demand for all this soy and continues to threaten the Serrano's biodiversity, the Amazons, and other native grasslands around the world. We need to stop eating meat. The choices we make on a day-to-day -day basis have direct impact on what occurs around the world. You may not be able to drive an electric car, you probably can't afford solar panels, but here's what you can do. Give up the consumption of meat, dairy, and all animal products to protect our environment and stop fueling the destruction of the Amazon, the Cerrado, and all its magical inhabitants. 
As a matter of fact, we need a clean environment to survive. It doesn't need us. And what we do to Mother Nature, we do to ourselves. Don't leave the world the way you found it. I'm Josh Garcia, and I'm asking you to get outside and trailblaze.